Welcome to this episode of Perspectives. And this is a encore performance by Dr. Dave Rico. Uh, Dave is a beautiful man. He's been a psychotherapist. It's his 50th anniversary. You may recall he was on our show around about a year ago where we talked about another one of his books. We talked about, I think, Daring to Trust. Today, we're going to be talking with Dave about his current book, Ready, How to Know When to Go and When to Stay. And we go deep. And it is, I would say, quite a confronting conversation in some ways, because if we are considering whether we stay in the relationship or whether to go, this is really important conversation. And what I love is he has in this book, shines a light on what we need to be considering to know whether it is worth staying or whether it's time to leave. And then what we speak about is the middle bit. Well, okay, so I probably think I need to go, but that's a lot to face. I've got a lot invested in this. Um, I've committed a lot to get to this point. I've tried to make this work. So what do we do with those feelings of resentment or worry or fear or grief or loss? So we talk about that as well. I fundamentally believe too many of us stay in relationships that are very important, so intimate relationships, where we are meant to be able to get our sense of felt sense of being seen, here, known, felt, and understood, where we're meant to have our needs around, uh, Dave talks about being accepted, being appreciated, knowing we're enough with them as we are. He talks about the five A's. It can be really tough to ever think it's okay to not have these needs met in relationships that are very primary to us. Those primary relationships where we are meant to be able to count on this person to some extent in a consistent way for these needs to be met. Not all of those needs are not all of the time, and we talk about that extensively. It's okay to want that in a relationship, and if you're not getting that, you're meant to be asking these questions. Should I stay or should I go? Is it able to become enough for me? Is it never going to become that? And I'm just in a delusion telling myself somehow one day it'll get better. These are hard conversations to have with ourselves, and then With all of that said, how do we become enough for ourselves where it isn't about what the other person's doing for us or not doing? If we do that enough, we eventually reach a point where primary relationships where we've been tolerating way too little for way too long, they become intolerable. That's what happens. So how to know if we should go or should stay really is how much have I grown? You will know. I believe, if you should go or stay once you've done the work for you on you because you will, once you've done the work and it never ends, but once you've done enough work where you no longer self-sacrifice, where you no longer turn away from what you need, where you no longer discount yourself as primary in this relationship along with this other person, when you get to that point, you will see the relationship as it is. And if it is enough to fulfill you because you now fulfill yourself as well, so they only need to bring a certain amount, you will stay. But if you get to that point where you've topped yourself up and you know you now and you know what you need and how you need it and it is not happening and you know you've tried enough, it's not going to happen, you will be okay with leaving it. It will be okay because you will no longer be able to tolerate settling for so little. So that's the conversation we have. Uh, Dave has written 24 books or 20. He's just written a staggering amount of books. I've read quite a few of his books. I'm a fan of his work and how he looks at it. Uh, He wrote Dare to Trust. He wrote a book called Triggers. He wrote another book that I'm about to read called When Your Past is Your Present, which is what it is for all of us. He combines Buddhism with psychotherapy. He brings in Carl Jung as well. But it also brings flavors of truth from all the great sages through time. And that's what I love. So it's a very enriching experience about how he looks at how we can look at ourselves. I love that about him. He really encourages us to, as I think is so crucial, to have deeper levels of self-awareness and self-understanding. 
So we know ourselves enough to know if this is good for us. And too many of us have been raised in cultures and in families where knowing ourselves has not been permissible. So that's what we dive into in this light and breezy, <laughs> in no way is this light and breezy conversation. This is Dave Rico. And hey, before you go and watch Dave, who's phenomenal, I really want to thank you for watching this podcast and for showing up. There are so many things you could be doing right now that isn't this. So I'm really grateful that you're here. And it would mean the world to me if you love it, if you could head to Apple and subscribe. Subscription numbers really help this get boosted in the podcast ranks. We have literally some episodes that have over a million views and heading for 1.5 million views, which is wonderful. But because it's in a medium that isn't measured as a success for podcast measurements, we're not getting the traction. So if you love the podcasts I'm doing, if you love the work I'm doing, you could show your appreciation by sharing this, by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts and subscribing. It would mean the world to me. I'd really appreciate it. And I appreciate you for being here. Enjoy the show. There seems to be this theme of people, particularly women, self-abandoning their truer selves and settling for reality or status quo that is causing them such distress and disconnect and denial of what is. And thematically, having read a number of your books now, because you combine Buddhism with psychotherapy and you bring in Jungian principles as well, this idea of not accepting what is causes us so much distress. Could you talk a little bit about that? You mean about staying put when you need to go? Is that yeah. what you mean? Or? Yeah. Well, I think before that, we don't even know if we should go because we're not even accepting what is. We're still trying to force it to be our illusion. We're still trying to make it change. We're still trying to fix it. We, we don't, a lot of us don't seem capable of just stepping back and seeing it and letting it be what it is. And from that place, do I stay or do I go? I'm glad you brought it up that way because... Um because I wanted to share that it's in a relationship, it's not about making it work. Mm. It's more about seeing how it works and then making the commitment that would keep it working if it is possible. Otherwise, we're um, like the stepsisters of Cinderella trying to squeeze our foot into a slipper that does not fit. Yes, yes. So we don't yes. want to go that way. Um, yes. If it takes a lot of work, day in, day out, yeah. um, just to achieve a very little bit of progress or no progress, that's the equivalent of uh, this isn't right for me. Mm. Now, most of us weren't brought up to notice when we're suffering. Yes. We were brought up instead to endure, mm -hmm. like put up with things, and uh, that's success. Mm. If, you can, if you can just hang on, stay with it. And that certainly works in some instances, but not in relationships. No. I also so, think we have a false sense of what loyalty is and we define it as loyalty to others or loyalty to a situation, for example, a marriage, but we never talk about loyalty to ourselves. And loyalty to ourselves, as you, as you started to say, um, is really loyalty to the reality of our situation yeah. and where we stand in it. And can I remain stable and be myself here? Or do I have to become a pretzel and make myself fit into something that um, ultimately is dissatisfying? See, we're used to being dissatisfied. And it seems like when you're demanding satisfaction, 
that's selfish. Uh, I would put it as it's okay to look for satisfaction, even though our Buddhist teaching tells us nothing is totally satisfactory. But um, as the British child psychiatrist Winnicott said, uh, all we need is good enough, not perfect. Mm. So if it's good enough, which means it, the relationship feels good most of the time and seems to be working because I believe and feel that I can be my full self here. And, you know, it's the same as what you're bringing up, but um, it's going to be hard to do that and not feel selfish if you've been brought up to adhere to other people's um, blueprint of whom you're supposed to be. Yeah. And by the way, um, about a year ago was my 50th anniversary as a psychotherapist. Congratulations. Yeah, and thank you. So I asked myself, what is the problem I heard the most of the 5,000 clients that I saw? And the answer came very quickly. It's staying too long in what doesn't work. Mm. Yes. Yes. And of course, doesn't work means I can't be myself here yeah. and I don't feel loved. And yet um, I'm sticking with it because that's what you should do. Or maybe because there's nowhere else to go. Or because we fear trusting ourselves enough to rock the boat or because we have so many cultural and family pressures telling us this is how it's meant to be and you need to tough it out, or because the alternative looks so uncertain, at least this is certainty. There mm -hmm. are so many ways we are conditioned and our neurology is designed to, I'm going to go for what I know because it feels familiar versus I'm going to go for what I don't know, having no clue how to navigate it, what it looks like, what it entails. I understand why people stay. It's massive to tip it upside down and let the toys fall on the floor and say, you know what, I'm not picking them up this time. Mm. And to let that be okay. Yes, <laughs> to let that be okay. Uh, right now, if I had you for three hours, I'd insert the entire content of your book triggers here because... Yeah. To let it be okay is to face the discomfort in ourselves that we have dared to upset a status quo that others are invested in, that we have risked them being discomforted by us saying, I'm going to put my peace first. Mm. That brings up the triggers of worthiness. Am I enough? Do I risk? Can I be seen in a space of being authentically myself and expressing my needs? So dumping metaphorically the toys on the floor is more than just I'm going to let it be. It's now I've got to face the discomfort in me as a result of letting it be. That's a very good way to put it. It's big. It really is. And anyone listening to this, connecting to this and feeling that sense of your own discomfort and you think your job is to keep taking care of everyone else's discomfort so they don't feel it too much, maybe there is an invitation here that it's okay to nurture you and not everybody else first or even second. What a thought. One of the things you talk about in Chapter 1 that I I have really been diving into this a lot, Dave, probably since our last conversation a year ago. We cling to a status quo and the grasping is what leads to the suffering. Would you speak to that a little bit and your, where you are with that at the moment? Uh, well, I'm always in personal conflict with it because I'm always 
grasping. Yeah, aren't we um, all? <laughs> aren't we all? Aren't but, we all? Um, let's start <laughs> with the uh, teachings in Buddhism. The causes of suffering are the grasping, the reaching out for what we think will fulfill us per per permanently, and the pushing away of what we believe will uh, not satisfy us. And as long as we're still doing this, as long as this is our uh, plan, I'm going to continually be on the lookout for the very person who will make everything wonderful or for the very thing that will make a big difference, then uh, I'm causing myself suffering because I'm not recognizing, first of all, that nothing is permanent and that there are moments of satisfaction, but not ongoing full satisfaction forever and ever. And secondly, that I haven't uh, first looked within for the fulfillment of um, the needs I've had since childhood. And I, um, talk about these needs as five specific ones. They all begin with A, so I call them the five A's. And these are the needs we had in early life. Um, attention, not as scrutiny, but as attentiveness, as a caring, watching out for what our needs were and trying to fulfill them. So that's that's the kind of attentiveness that we were looking for. Um, and of course, this was required in infancy because we couldn't do any anything thing for ourselves. So everything depended upon our caretakers. And so they had to pay enough attention to our cries since we were also nonverbal. They had to be able to tell when we were looking for food, when we were looking to be changed, when we were looking to be held. And they had to be able to read those three and then fulfill the particular need that we had at the moment. So, um, Part of this, is it, since it includes holding, is um, a, a physical affection. So that's the second A. So we needed affection that would be shown to us physically so that it would be felt throughout our body. What would be felt? Uh, I am held here in a trustworthy embrace. It's always appropriate. It's never abusive. In addition, and as part of that, um, we had to have the sense that we were valued, that they really, they are caretakers, parents, one parent, whoever it may be, um, really uh, saw the value in us. They, they cherished us rather than, oh, here's another burden, here's another mouth to feed. We didn't get that sense from uh, when, our, when we had healthy parenting. We got this feeling of, oh, they love having me here, and uh, I really matter to them. In fact, the word appreciation is from the Latin word for price. I'm of great price. Uh, then when we started to show our particular personality, which of course we were born with, when we started to show the basics of who we are, unique, singular, different from everyone else, we would want acceptance that they fully um, 
that they made room, they granted hospitality to our full personality rather than insisting that we be what they thought we should be. So that's the acceptance. And that's the one that we would be giving to ourselves, especially as we get healthier. <clears throat> I accept myself as I am, not as I think I should be in accord with the um, requirements of society or other people or religion. And then finally, uh, when the time came for us to crawl across the floor instead of be carried across, when we first left on our own, they had to be fully on board with that and they had to allow it. They couldn't grab us and say, no, no, you need me to carry you. They loved the fact that we were now becoming mobile, that we could crawl, then we could walk, we could even leave the room that they were in and go to another room. Then we could leave home altogether and go to school. Then we could leave home altogether and go to college. And then we could leave altogether and start on our own adult life. So all throughout the cycle, they are permitting us to um, let go of them. You would have to be a healthy parent to be able to allow that. Yeah. So the five A's then, which represent uh, what love looks like. Here's how love is shown. Somebody is attentive to my needs and feelings. Someone shows affection in appropriate ways, appreciates me rather than takes me for granted, accepts me just as I am personality-wise, and allows me to go when I need to go, and to design a lifestyle that's in keeping with my own deepest needs, wishes, and DNA. So if I came in with a gender issue or I came in with gayness, that was perfectly okay with them. Yeah. Rather than uh, we need to twist you into uh, the standard mold. My preference. So, yeah. My preference for you to make me feel less uncomfortable. Then I'll feel better. Yeah. So it's attention, affection, appreciation, acceptance, and allowing. And when you have those five A's from your parents, you will feel fulfilled. Mm. You won't feel as if I have to try to grasp, I have to get something outside of this household. Uh, Winnicott calls this kind of a household a holding environment. Yes. one in which you feel held, not held in the sense of held back, but held in the sense of um, there's room in here for all of me. Mm. And then uh, you would want to give those same five A's to yourself. And then third, so first from your parents, second to yourself, I pay attention to myself. I take care of my body. That's the affection. That's the affection. I accept myself as I am. I appreciate myself. I allow myself to make the choices that reflect my true nature. And uh, then third, I will want to receive those five A's from other adults. And when you're giving and receiving at the same time in a partnership, that's intimacy. So intimacy is you give me the five A's and I give them to you. Mm. Now, in infancy, we needed people to give us 100%. But as we grew up, we found many resources many ways to receive the five A's from 
nature, other people, family members, teachers, nature, religion, peers. We found many other uh, resources to turn to. And by the time we became adults, we only now need needed 25% instead of 100% from a partner. <clears throat> so when you come across that way, I only need 25%. I got 75% of my need fulfillment already taken care of. You're not going to feel like a burden to the other person. You're going to feel like a full on adult. And you're only uh, giving 25%. If you notice you're with somebody who has a, is kind of a bottomless pit, can't ever get enough of those five A's. And never give and, it back to you. And can't give it back. Um, then it's not working and it won't work until that person does his or her own personal work. So, um, no matter so how that's the direct connection cry. between childhood and adulthood. And also clinging. And that's where the clinging comes from. Because if the other person's not capable of giving it, but we need it no matter what, we need that to feel yes. safe, secure, and that we belong, that we're worthy for this person and we're worthy for ourselves. We have, we need some of that back. It's okay to need that. It's not neediness. If anyone's listening, thinking that's neediness, it's not, it's healthy to want someone to attune to us in a way that is meaningful to us. That is intimacy, not the way they prefer it or the way they think you should want it or the way they insist it's going to be, but the way that works with you. That's okay to want that. And when it's not there, you say in one of your chapters, and I love this, we can be clinging more the less they give it. And that's the, that's the irony, that's poor language, but that's the paradox. The less this person's giving to us, the more we're going to, I call it clinging, grasp, grasping, and uh, being compulsive. There's a compulsion to cling for it and crave it in the space of the starvation of it. Mm -hmm. And the other feature of neediness is that no matter how much of it, how much of the need fulfillment you do receive, it never feels like it's enough. Mm -hmm. You'll always be wanting more like an addict. Yes. In fact, it has an addictive quality, as you I, said. I, it's yes, compulsive. it does. It is compulsive. It, it is addictive. Yeah. This, this craving to feel fulfilled because most of us, Dave, are never taught how to fulfill our needs for ourselves. We don't know how to feel topped up. We're constantly trying to plug in. So many of gosh, I'm coming across so many people right now who are trying to plug in to a source of stability, security, belonging, worthiness, because mm -hmm. no one's being taught how to turn to self for this. Yeah. Well, that's a very good way to put it. And uh, by the way, if you trace the need that you have that feels unfulfillable, like a bottomless pit, you will discover that that's the very one of the five, or it could be more than one of the five or all five. Yes. That will be the very one that you missed out on from your parents. So here you are trying to make up for what you didn't get in the past. And this innocent bystander, who is the partner that you have just hooked up with, um, doesn't get it that you're coming in with a need that has nothing to do with that partner. It, it's um, anachronistic. It's going back to the past, even though you're in the present. So that's why the name of my book that you have there is The Past in the Present. Mm. Uh, is that the name of it? When the Past is Present. Oh, I'm sorry. When the Past is Present. Yeah. Which and is all the time. 
It's always present. It is. Um, but you just want to notice it and relate to it, not be swayed by it, not be, uh, shall we say, uh, driven by it. Controlled um, by it. I've been thinking of a poem by Emily Dickinson. Uh, is it okay to recite it? Yes, of course, please. Okay, so I'm going to recite it and then I'm going to uh, go back and show how it fits with our topic. And uh, before I start, remember that if one of these five A's or more than one were missing in the past, it would have felt like a loss because instinctively we knew that the caregivers are supposed to come across attentively, acceptantly, appreciatively, affectionately, and so forth. And allowing, so yeah. If it wasn't happening, we would we would have felt like there's something missing that's supposed to be here. Yes. We wouldn't be able to name it nope. until later in life. Um, oh, or now I see what was missing. But we would have felt, um, yeah, like we were somehow in mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. So here's the poem. A loss of something ever felt I. The first that I could recollect bereft I was of what I knew not. Too young that any should suspect a mourner walked among the children. I, notwithstanding, went abroad as one bemoaning a dominion, herself the only prince cast out. Elder today, a session wiser and fainter too as wiseness is, I find myself still softly searching for my delinquent palaces. And a suspicion like a finger touches my forehead now and then that I am looking oppositely for the sight of the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Kingdom of heaven is within. So she said um, abroad in, in the 19th century meant outside the house, not Europe. So when she says, I went abroad, she, she means I left my family home and I went out searching, that's the grasping, mm -hmm. for the somebody who would provide the, the palace of happiness that my childhood was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But gradually I got it oh, I'm not supposed to be looking for this out there abroad. I'm supposed to be looking for it in here. And then if I do, then when I do find it, something out there, I can appreciate it, but I'll no longer be uh, craving it because I already found it within. The poem says, the, whole, the, the poem makes the point of my entire yes. talk so far. Everybody, you, 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 you get the idea. Yeah. And that which we crave controls us. Yeah. So and if she wrote this during the Civil War, uh, hello, it shows us none of this is new. This goes oh, way back. Yes. It's just part of being human. Yes, it is. One of the things you talk about in this book, Ready, How to Know When to Go and When to Stay, is this idea of we get used to our suffering. We get accustomed to the discontent within us and we feel or tell ourselves it's normal. It's a little bit about the enduring, but it's more than that. It's particularly I'm noticing it with women, Dave, this we don't, we're not taught our needs. We don't know our needs. We don't know how to therefore articulate a need. We don't know that we are meant to be healthily in relationships where needs are reciprocated 
to 25% or whatever. So we find ourselves settling for too little and not realizing there is so much more that we could be experiencing in life if we just knew our needs and stopped telling ourselves suffering, which to me is not knowing how to attune to ourselves, isn't okay, isn't normal. It doesn't have to be like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and I totally agree. And you're right. Um, when you're brought up to be attentive to others' needs yes. and to think that being attentive to your own needs is a form of selfishness, uh, you're not going to survive very well. I'll, I'll never forget the very first time I was on a plane and the, uh, you know, how at the beginning before you take off the steward or stewardess makes some announcements. When I heard her say, if you need oxygen, put the mask on yourself first and then on your children. When I first heard that, I was like totally shocked. <laughs> I mean, I just couldn't imagine how could I possibly take care of myself first? That's totally wrong. And, you know, it showed me uh, I was never really given permission yeah. to either know my needs or take care of my needs. They were telling me what my needs were. Mm. The school was telling me, yeah. the peers were telling me, society was telling me, and so forth. Um, I also wanted to throw in that um, you could use the five A's as a starting point to find out your needs. Mm. What is the quality of attention that I want? For instance, I would like to be in a relationship in which the other person truly listens to me with an engaged focus rather than thinking what uh, he or she is going to say next. Or, I want that or, kind hearing of us, or hearing us not to be attentive to understanding us, but to hear us as a way of then proving a different point. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. Which is not attentiveness, it's just control. <laughs> so you ask yourself, what is the particular flavor of attention that I am looking for? And then go down the list with what kind of affection do I want? What kind of ac acceptance and so forth? So that's the first way to find out what your needs are. And the second way is to ask yourself, am I an introvert or extrovert? How much time do I need alone in the course of a day? Mm. And am I with a partner with whom the timing will mesh? For instance, if the partner needs 90% of the day alone, and I need only 30% alone, we're gonna have big problems. So you want to find out beforehand, like, are you an introvert who loves being alone and is self-nurtured? Or are you like an outgoing people person and you wanna be out there going to parties? Uh, those are two different kinds of people. And we have to know ourselves. I always thought I was an extrovert until uh, my friend who's also a therapist, she said, I, I think you're actually an introvert, but you're afraid people won't like you if you don't act in an extroverted way. She was exactly right. From that moment on, I became aware of my need for alone time, for being alone. And I think this is extremely important in a relationship, don't you? 
I do. I, then if they're at 90% wanting to be alone, but they want an intimate relationship, I, I'm going to challenge saying, I agree. <laughs> that's not really an intimate relationship. <laughs> no, unless you find somebody who also wants 90 Yes, and there's we'll only intimacy yeah, intimacy at 10%. Um, yeah, we I just would... meet for cocktails and dinner and that's it. Yes. Yeah. And sex. Yes, yeah. So to me, the 90% one, you've pushed me because I'm thinking, okay, but every now and again in a relationship that's intimate, the other person's going to have a need. Like you've got to pick up the kids even though it's interfering with your 90%. I have a crisis, even though it interferes. And then that's, I, I think it's got to be a wave of flexibility that it's. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Back and forth. Yeah. Uh, also, um, a way of looking at it very simply, uh, two legitimate ways of being in a relationship, of which there are many, but let's just look at two. And I'm going to use my hands uh, to kind of make the point. Um so some people want this we're we looking we're looking at each other at all times we're always together and we go through life like that and it's parallel and face to face mm -hmm. okay yeah other people want this we're connected but we go into the world as two separate people mm -hmm. there's this connection but we're, uh, I look this way, you look that way. Both are legitimate. Yep. Here's where there's a problem. Mm -hmm. I want this, you want this. Mm. Th this has to be clarified before you even imagine marriage yes. or, or living together or being in any relationship. If you want this, and I want this, it's not going to work mm. at all. And some people want this. Yes, back and forth, no problem, as long as so you it's, can. Yeah, it's as long interdependent. As you can mesh the times. Yeah. To me, no the problem. healthiest relationship is interdependent as we do it together. Then it's dependence. I need you right now. I need you right now. And then it's independence. Mm. I think all three positions in flow, That's a very good not, point. not rigidly, but in flux. So that it's a both level, end. It's both end. And that level of adaptive to be that adaptive in the relationship to me means the relationship will evolve and progress. But if it has to be this to make you happy, or it has to be this to make you happy, or it has to be this to make you happy, I'm going to find it very, it's going to be stullifying. The relationship must stall by definition because there isn't growth in one. The flow is in I can be different. I can show up differently in this moment. I can face this moment differently. Right now I'm not capable. Right in this moment I am capable. That's growth and accepting the person. But it's, you know what, I need a lot of alone time. I'm going to question why be in the relationship. If you really are rigidly, I need this no matter what, Mm, I'm going to question if you should progress with that person. Mm. Makes sense. Yes. Mm. I like that. So one of the things you took about you, I really got into chapter one. <laughs> yeah. I read your whole book twice. Chapter one, one of the things you say, uh, I, want to, I want to do it justice. The only hope worthy when we're questioning whether to go or stay is one that is activated, activated, by the evidence of change. And yes. I think I see too many relationships in the work that I do where one person is hopeful for the change, wishes for the change, desperate for the change. In the other person, it's driving them crazy. And the golden rule they're forgetting is you can't change anyone. But if that person won't shift their behavior, hope can die. And this is really painful position to get to in a relationship when you have hopes and dreams that you're going to move forward. I think you could use this as the metaphor. And they're just stuck and they won't change or even consider talking about it. And the other partner's stuck with, well, where's my hope? 
Um, so, two kinds of hope. Well, no, let's say two uses of the word hope. One use of the word hope is wishful thinking. Yep. Oh, I know he's eventually going to stop drinking. I have a feeling. Uh, this time though, will be different, Dave. This, this time, time will be different. This time yeah. will be different. I can let him back in. So that's the I'm, wishful thinking. Wish I'm going to abandon wishful. myself one more time in the hope that they won't abandon me. I'm going exactly. to give up my truth in the hope that they will create a different truth for me. That's the wishful thinking. But you call it hope. I'm hoping that this, I have a lot of hope that this time it's going to work. My view, and I imagine yours also, Remy, is the, it's only, it's only worthy of the name hope if there's ongoing evidence of change for the better. Yeah. The, well, I'm going to go back and say to me, it's evidence of awareness of the discord in the relationship. So the person that's rigidly not changing, just go earlier with your alert system. If they're not even showing awareness that this is causing you so much pain and discomfort and this and you're feeling so discomforted, if your partner can't attend to this pain in you, they don't even have awareness around it, you don't even have to get to whether or not they're making a change. They could be stubbornly just denying you're having a bad experience and saying it's not that bad. It's not that big a deal. It'll be different next time. If you're hearing that, just a lack of responsibility to awareness, already you're getting the red flag, let alone if they're willing to work on it. They're putting it back on you or they're saying it's not that big a deal or it'll be okay next time or can't we talk about it later. You're hearing what I think you talk about in the book about the Peter Pan syndrome. You're hearing someone who, let alone change, isn't even going to acknowledge there's a problem. Mm. Yeah, so you're saying um, there isn't even a chance for hope if the other person doesn't even get it that a change is necessary. And how many times are you going to go to the dry well trying to convince them this is real for you? How many times? And I don't call that hope. I call that denying current moment. That yes, is not reality. It is denying the reality of right now and trading right now and the pain you're feeling right now for the wishful thinking of a different tomorrow. And that is self-abandonment to me. That is constantly having to give my pain up in the hope that tomorrow will somehow be different. I don't think that's hope. And I'd go further and say hope is often an escape from the present moment. Mm -hmm. So... This being the case, um, it would be a wonderful and useful practice and very profitable for a relationship in which you do want to know your needs and act on them and not be in a relationship which really will never be satisfactory. A wonderful practice is um, the unconditional yes to the way things are. Yes. That would be the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Yeah. And to get it that. Um, <clears throat> this is one of my favorite things right now in my life, Dave. It's the okay. unconditional yes to this here and now. Yeah. And being mindful of how many ways I want to twist and distort it into more of a preference. It's like, okay, but come back to here and now. I'm spending most days now, Dave, when I'm alone saying I'm here and now and just attempting as best I can to experience here and now without me wanting to distort it or control mm -hmm. it or manipulate it or shift it or start thinking about tomorrow, or worrying about yesterday, just the practice of here and now. It's one of my favorite practices. Good. And so it's, there's no um, use of euphemisms, words that make it sound better when it isn't. No. There's no um, <clears throat> denying the full wallop of what's happening. <clears throat> you are uh, completely faithful 
to reality. Yeah. And it's it's hard for us to do this. It's hard because we live in a world of of imagination and uh, snake oil salesmen, and you know everything will be taken care of. Everything will be all right. And, but Dave, uh, it's worse than that. The here and now is hard to experience. If we built a relationship on a lie, if we built a relationship on what we hoped it would be. And the crashing reality is it's never going to be that. I understand why it's easy just to keep believing in the illusion that one day it's that. I get that. The here and now, that's incredibly painful to know you're about to tip the toys onto the table or just keep pretending it's not. We are misusing what I believe is sacred in all of us. Every time we trade this moment for a dream we had or a dream we hope will eventually come true, we are, this is really hard, we are abandoning the truth of ourselves being able to handle here and now. That's what I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. Every time we trade to the past and the future, we are saying I am not enough for this moment and it's not true. We are enough for this moment. Yeah. So we would want to, <clears throat> shall we say, align ourselves to the shape reality has taken yeah. in our lives. And we would be sitting in the saddle in the direction the horse is going. Yes. Not backwards. Yeah. And if you've spent years in a relationship pretending somehow it's going to change, you're going to feel very committed. Um, there's going to be cognitive dissonance because you've committed so long to the illusion. And you might be hearing this or however it's come to you that this isn't true. That is a massive amount of cognitive dissonance. The ego in us, and now I refer you to another book, Daring to Trust, that you've written that I've loved, and a couple of others where you talk about this gap where this, that's a monumental gap to face and accept. And it can be very crushing. And this is where you talk beautifully in this book, Ready, How to Know When, it, when to Go or When to Stay. It's this, the crushing reality, we can push it away, but all we're doing is pushing away reality and pushing away the truth that we are worthy of joy, worthy of love, worthy of being attended to and attuned to and affirmed and appreciated. We're giving it up. That's a lot to face if we're going to face this moment and we're considering whether to go or whether we should stay. Mm. That fits. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about Peter Pan syndrome? You talk about uh, it in this book, Freddy. Uh, Peter Pan syndrome has to do with the style, uh, usually of a male, um, <clears throat> although there's a female version of it. Um, so this is the guy who uh, sweeps into your life with a lot of excitement. He's fun to be with, but he's not going to stay. And he's not going to make a commitment and do the work that it takes to have a relationship be successful. He's going to come and go at will, like Peter Pan. He's going to take you flying the way he took Wendy but he's always going to put you back where you came from and he's going to take off God knows where. And uh, he's just never grown up. It's a adolescent, it's a arresting, it's an a developmental arrest yeah. in adolescence. And uh, this type of person will be very charming. So it's easy to get swept off your feet. Mm -hmm. 
um, if you could just enjoy this kind of a person as a witness yes. and have a little fun here and there, no problem. Yep. All but good. if you're going to attach yourself to him, you're in big trouble. Yeah. But he doesn't like attachments. Nope. And doesn't like responsibility. No accountability. No. Does not plan for the future. So you'll never no, have a sense all, of Those control. are all considered uh, restraints. Yes. Including commitments. He doesn't want restraints. And of course, it's okay to be this way if this is if this is who you are. But it would be good to be honest and let others know. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to be here very long. I'm just here to have as much fun as I can have, and then I'll be taking off. And if or it's some not people fun, would hear that and say, "Oh, I I think I can convince them to stay." <laughs> yeah, and if it's not fun, they're not going to do what's hard because they don't know how they don't have the awareness around how they avoid responsibility so they're not going to do conflict which you talk about in this book they're not yeah. going to do the hard conversations they can't show up when it's really someone's backs to the wall because they're just going to flit away so the very moments when you're most in need they're going to be turning away because it's not theirs and and I think it's also another level Dave I can't remember if you spoke about this to me there's a sense if they did show up, they'd be feeling there was somehow uh, being controlled. That oh, is, yes. they, yeah, it's a feel. They would feel controlled. Yes. <laughs> if they showed up. Yes. That's yeah. Any requirement will feel like I'm being controlled and I'm being restrained. Yes. And I, I won't permit that. No, exactly. One uh, of the you things know, that the I words that they would most dislike would be for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, and sickness and health till death do us part. That's what they absolutely don't want. Mm. Mm. I think they can want the idea of it, Dave, because they do go into marriage, but I don't think they understand what the reality actually means or entails. They don't see it. It's they just don't have a perceptual awareness of what that in, what that commitment entails. It means something else. It means mm -hmm. on their an entitlement on their terms, their way, in their time frame, when it suits them. That's what they're processing. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah. And Jung called this um, this, shall we say, uh, disability. Uh, the puer syndrome. Puer is the Latin word for boy, as in puerile. Mm. And the Latin word for girl is puella. And so there's also a puella syndrome mm. in which a female, but much less likely, yeah. but a female can do the very same thing. Mm. Yeah. She comes in and she uh, seduces you and then she disappears. Mm. And so before anyone thinks so it's, with, just it's seduce and withhold. Yes. And that's the same thing Peter Pan does. It's the same seduce thing. Seduce and withhold. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to, and I think if you're listening to this and you probably think I might be in this relationship, the best and simplest way I, I find is just watch if words align with actions. And if the actions don't align with the words, right there, start getting more and more curious. Don't let it go. Don't convince yourself it's just a one-time thing. Let, let it speak for itself. That is being here and now. There is an action that is not aligned with words. Don't turn away from it. Don't justify it for them. Do not excuse it. And I'm not saying run from it, but you need to be curious about it because this when it matters, when you've got children and you've got a career and you're sick and you need to be helped and you need to be held, their words, I'm there for you, and their actions will not align. No, they certainly won't. No. And, of course, you could convince yourself that they will eventually align. And uh, once again, you're not being faithful to the reality. Uh, you reminded me of that uh, quotation by Maya Angelou. Are you familiar with it? I'm familiar with Maya, but I don't know the quote. Okay, here's her quote. 
When people show you who they are, believe, believe them, them the first believe time. Believe them the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's my favorite quote. Don't keep asking, oh, wait a minute, maybe it's going to be different tomorrow. Yeah, or maybe if I explain to them enough, they'll finally get it. Or if I can show them how much I love them. One of the ways I look at that quote is if we don't know ourselves and we don't claim ourselves and treat ourselves as sacred, what we'll do is change ourselves in the hope that somehow that will help them get it. I'll become more loving. I'll become more dedicated. I'll become mm. more in service. I will show them how loyal I am and then they'll eventually get it. No, they won't. They will not. What they get is what they get. You don't. And then the next level of that day for me is the women particularly who spend too much any energy thinking their lack of showing up and their lack of reciprocity is a challenge on our own self-worth that somehow if I can just show myself to be more worthy, <laughs> somehow it's not about your self-worth. It's not about no. you. That is their limit. That is their capacity. Stop working so hard. And one of the things I tell my clients, Dave, is for 48 hours, stop. Stop rescuing, excusing, fixing, controlling, explaining, over-explaining, convincing, crying, losing it. Just for 48 hours, as much as your compulsions are telling you to do something to get out of your pain, if you can, as much as you can for 48 hours, let it and them be and see the reality. When you don't perform, what's there when you're no longer in service to it but in service to holding yourself as best you can see the gap see the void see what they are not capable of filling and then realize you have been the source of everything you have been the source of the love of the effort of the commitment of doing the work just stop and let them do them and assess mm. it from that place. Stop the performance. Yes, I see that. That's excellent advice. Because then all you've been looking at is the result of your own work, yes. not a mutual enterprise. Yes. And the exhaustion of stopping yeah. is so hard. You know, one of the things I talk to people about, it, you will feel so tense stopping because you have conditioned yourself that somehow if you work harder somehow you can fix this and there will be such exhaustion and tension in you when you stop it'll be the the addiction to do something will have you shaking and crying it'll be i have to do something and if you can just for two days not you can go back to being as addictive as you want after that, but just for two days, don't. Well, because otherwise, if they think they have to always stop, it's too much. The compulsions are just too big. Just two days, get off the drug and let it be. And then very quietly begin assessing as gently as possible. It takes more work than this, Dave, as you know, yes. how it is and not how you try to force it. Hmm. Yeah, I like one that. Of the, one of the things you talk about in the book that really resonates is, uh, you didn't say it quite this way, but the way I make sense of this for me is we can put energy into anger, resentment, uh, hostility, but really it's a way of not facing our grief at the loss of how things aren't. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because it's one of my favourite themes right now, that we're avoiding grief the loss of the delusion, the loss of the hope, the loss of the way we hoped it would be, it's a sense of loss. And instead of grieving, we try to control or get it. We do a whole bunch of stuff out here because we don't know how to go in here. That when you are basically um, feeling one loss after another, one disappointment after another in a relationship, uh, one uh, betrayal after another, mm -hmm. that um, the 
the way to respond to that is with the built-in, shall we say, electronics of the human body, which is to show grief, as in the poem, uh, no one knew that a mourner walked among the children. She had a brother and a sister, but my parents didn't notice that I was there as a mourner. I was there mourning what I was not getting that I know I deserved. And um, instead of doing this grief work on ourselves, we put the energy into blaming and resenting the other person okay. or even retaliating. Yes. Uh, Shakespeare has such an interesting one line uh, in Troilus and Cressida. Um, the hope of revenge shall hide our inward woe. Yeah. Woe back then meant grief. Yeah. The hope of revenge, as long as we can retaliate, we will never have to feel grief. Mm -hmm. He noticed that's how humans do it. Mm -hmm. So always look at how you're trying to get back at the other person in the relationship, because guaranteed under that will to revenge is unexpressed grief, unshed tears. And it's understandable that we all run away from grief because it doesn't feel very good to be sad and depressed and angry, impotently angry yeah. and scared. Yeah. That's what grief is. It's not fun. But if we are doing our absolute fealty, fidelity to reality, then grief makes sense because it's what people really need to do yes. when they're having such a hard time. Mm. So if you're in a relationship and you're trying to control them, you're trying to change reality, you're trying to make it better, you're trying to hold it all together, you're doing all the rescuing, all the claiming, all the work, that is a way of avoiding your grief. Yeah. And that would be what they call codependency. Yes. Which is where you're doing too much for no, for no return. For for you're doing more than you will ever get satisfaction for. And when, you're, and when you don't get satisfaction, you blame yourself that you yes. haven't done enough. It's doing so much in and then getting a crumb and letting yourself be convinced that that's a sign that things are improving. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hope based on a crumb. <laughs> yes. This, this means more than it does. It's, yeah. it's all you're going to get. So as we come towards the end of this beautiful and really important conversation about the work we can do, other, we're going to get the book, which is I've loved, ready, how to know when to go and when to stay. And I can't hold it up because it hasn't quite been released yet in Australasia. Is that correct? It's coming in May. Right. Yeah. You very kindly given me a media use version. The book is ready, how to know when to go and when to stay. Let's end this conversation on a hopeful note. So hopefully we've helped the viewers and the listeners with what to be looking for, what to tune into, what to be aware of, and it's okay to be aware of it. Don't be afraid or be conditioned to thinking you shouldn't look closely at the stuff we've been talking about. You absolutely, to serve yourself, have every right to deserve to look at under some of these rocks if this is relevant to you. Once we've done that, and there's some, and in the book you list many, many ways that we could be looking at this differently, which is fantastic. What could, can you give us a couple of ideas of what we can do once we're seeing reality? Our five needs are not being met to at least 25% in a way that is consistent or meaningful or feels loving to us. What's some 
Obviously, there's a choice about leaving, but how do we bridge to get to that point where we're going to say enough other than endure? You would have to put the accent first on how to strengthen yourself yes. and nurture yourself yes. so that it would become uh, less and less appealing yes. to stay even one more minute than is required. That is it. That is it. That is the true hope. That yeah. stop the hope of it or them changing and no true hope is you can fortify yourself. You can grow yourself. You can give yourself the five A's. You can tune into your own grief. You can handle your grief. And if you can give yourself the gift of stop avoiding the discomfort, stop hiding from your fear, stop hiding from the pain, stop hiding from your hurt and sit with it and grieve with it and love the parts of you that are feeling that you do that enough, one day it's intolerable and you will not stay. Yeah, I see that. It makes perfect sense. Of course, you would want to go to therapy, couples therapy or relationship therapy if, and see if that would help. But when you see that that isn't going anywhere either, that's when it's time to uh, move on. Could this be what we feared all along? The idea of moving on on my own. Yes. I was about to it's say terrifying that. Terrifying prospect. Yep. I was about to say exactly um, that. And you're reminding me of a quote by Alice Miller, a uh, Swiss psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And this would be a good one to, for me to end on. Um, and she's talking about childhood compared to adulthood. Yep. How can someone taught to obey, ever face the prospect of life alone without a sense of emptiness. Mm. How can someone taught to obey rather than to be responsible for yourself? Yeah. How can someone taught to obey ever face the prospect of life alone without a sense of emptiness? That sense of emptiness is what keeps us stuck. That's it. In a house that uh, gives no fulfillment. And the work is to fulfill ourselves enough so that we know that alone is preferable. That what yes. we thought we got from that person was simply a compulsion. We're just acting out the childhood over and over and over and over to be alone. And also, Dave, I'm going to go further and say, we can't do all the healing we need to do when we're in this type of dynamic. If we're in the home and this is what we're experiencing daily, to ask ourselves to manage our triggers, to trust ourselves, to heal ourselves, to feel whole in that environment, which to me is almost abusive, that's mm -hmm. a big ask. Yeah. So on a hopeful note, I'm going to say to our viewers, if you, this is a really important topic, but it's a heavy topic. It's deep. It's hard. The work to do if you're going to do this, get the book. The work to do is hard, but you're choosing your heart. You're choosing the heart of staying and sacrificing yourself and telling yourself every single day, my needs are less worthy than holding this together. For some reason, I've long forgotten. Or you can choose the heart of doing the work. One hard means nothing changes. Doing the work, that is hard work. You will come out of the other side and you will be your own source of sunshine. You will be your own source of love and affirmation and attunement. And that, I think, is truly the point of being on this earth, to know that you are enough. And, and that then you'll be ready for a healthy relationship. Exactly, exactly. Dave, once again, it's been such a pleasure having you on our show. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Your work is wonderful and important. Thank you so much. Thank you. What is the ideal community for us to live in? What would we value, avoid, encourage? 
because I don't believe enough of our leaders are thinking about it, and because if we don't focus on it, we're going to get whatever the most dominant voices decide for us. For every person who asks this question, five answers can present themselves. But it's still, I believe, a worthy question, and the answer is important. My answer to the question goes something like this. The ideal community would teach love, compassion, and respect. My name is Sharon Pearson, and I'm here to share how to discover, awaken, and connect with the truest you, leading to a happier, more fulfilled life. I'm going to bring my experience as an entrepreneur, coach, author, and creator of mindset models to make life way better. Join us for open-minded discussions on how to live your fullest life when getting by seems oh so easy to achieve. 